Chapter 5 They Argued Jake thought that due to Sterling's knee, he should set out alone with the map. He felt he would make better time without her and could bring back help. He was probably right. Except Sterling was convinced he might get lost. He already said he sucked at camping and had no life skills for the forest. She was even more worried since he proposed taking a shortcut on the map if it proved that the pond did exist where the two of them had reasoned it might be. They pored over the paper for most of the afternoon, debating where things were and where they should be on the map. After dinner, they knew exactly where they were. It had been a total coincidence. Jake had gone out to get more snow to melt on the stove for drinking water when he stopped in the doorway. Sarah, you need to see this, he said as he looked at markings carved into the door frame. With Jake's help, Sterling hopped to the doorway. She squinted against the afternoon sun as it shone through the snow. The markings were faint and old, but still readable. Waldo's hut. The only reason I noticed it was the angle of the sun. Jake traced a finger over the letters in the wood. It was in the shadows otherwise. Do you think the Waldo sticker on the map is where we are? Sterling looked at Jake excitedly. He grinned back. I do. It had changed the entire situation. Now that they had a sense of direction, a chance to find their way into the town of Earth's siding, they knew the general direction of the sun. They were on Jerry's logging road. All they had to do was follow it past Buckshot Caves to Cold Side Road and then to town. Yet Jake thought that he should set off alone, go through Den's misery to the Terry Whittle homestead since it was closer on the map. He felt they should take the chance and get assistance from the Terry Whittles. Sterling argued that the Terry Whittles were probably dead or had moved to a retirement home, leaving their house abandoned since the thirty years the map had been issued. Earth's siding was the most likely source of rescue. Plus, there was no need to take any shortcuts to get to the town, so there was no risk of getting lost. There was a risk of not reaching it before nightfall and risk of exposure. Neither of them were good at judging distance on the map. There was no legend to say how many miles long the road was. It could be that called Side Road was just out of sight around the next bend in the logging road, or it could be twenty miles. Then who knew how many more miles to Earth's siding? They just did not know. Which led to the third option, to shelter in place until food or wood ran out and hope for an unlikely rescue before then. It did not help that Sterling did not want to be left behind, sitting in the cabin, warm, toasty, and worrying. She would worry about Jake, and that was a problem. Sterling was getting to like him far too much. It also crossed her mind that he might find out just who she was and decide not to rescue her. While she did not think Jake was like that, they had only known each other for a short time. Okay so he probably would have other people rescue her than slap a non-disclosure agreement at her, Sterling thought. Finally, they agreed to sleep on it, and Sterling woke up alone the next day. Jake? She frowned as she noticed one of the survival blankets missing, a few cans of food missing, a knapsack left by Waldo their absent host was missing. Sterling felt the stirrings of anger as she hobbled around the small shack. There was a note on the desk along with her phone, most telling of all, the map was missing. Sarah, I found your phone. Thought you might like to have it, even if the battery is dead. Decided to compromise. I will walk to Earth's siding to get help. Stay in the shack, Jake. For the love of fudge and wine! Sterling growled into the empty air before letting out a huff and sitting down on the cot. How dare he! She would go after him, except Sterling knew that she would slow him down if she did even manage to catch up to him. Her knee felt a little better, but it was not up to walking speed and probably would only be injured worse at the end of the day. What he should have done was wait until her heel was healed enough that both of them could set out together. He was not thinking, and she could prove it. CEO of Ramsley Insurance sets off into snowstorm with canned food but no can opener. How does he even run a business? Grange would not like that headline. It was too bizarre, even though it was true. 
What did Jake think he was going to do? Run into a bear with a can opener and politely ask to use it? There was no wind outside, but big fat flakes were falling. Sterling could make them out through the dusty window. At the very least, Jake should have waited until it was not snowing. He was going to get lost. She just knew it. Sterling was going to give herself an ulcer from worry. Resolving to ignore the worry and try to stay mad at him, she made herself a cup of coffee. As she was reaching for a pack of instant oatmeal, something furry skittered over her hand, scrambling to get away from her. Sterling screamed, snatching back her hand. Stumbling backward to get away, she fell onto the cot as the blur of fur ran under it. Where was Jake when she needed him? Sterling clutched at the side of the cot as she peered underneath it, looking for the rodent. It had better not be a rat. She did not do well with rats. Or mice, for that matter. They were kind of like bats without the wings, but having tails instead. From the corner of the cot, a chipmunk gazed back at her in confusion. Sighing in relief, Sterling let herself relax. Hello, little Larry descendant. She decided to let him be. He probably would not get into much of anything and was terrified of her. It was likely the little creature would leave as soon as she stopped looking at him. Plus, he was a cutie. A box caught her eye. It was dusty and at the far corner under the bed. Sliding gently off the cot, Sterling winced as her knee made careful contact with the floor. She reached under, pulling the box toward herself as the chipmunk scampered away. Sitting up, Sterling lifted the lid to see what was inside. A flare gun and three flares greeted her. Setting the box on the desk, Sterling managed to get back up on her feet. She sat at the desk and took the gun out of the box. It looked the same as the flare gun her Uncle Jim Bob had had for his boat. Jim Bob taught Sterling and her brother Brandt how to load and fire the flare gun. Sterling had once threatened to shoot Dixby Cooley with one, when he got a little fresh after prom and they went fishing in their finery. Small-town living was sometimes an interesting thing. Checking over the gun to see if there was any obvious reason to her untrained eye that it would not work, Sterling carefully loaded it. With the snow falling thickly outside, it would not be of much use. However, if it let up and she heard another snowmobile, she was now prepared to catch their attention. It would be funny if she saved the day when Jake was still tromping around in the snow. Jake plowed through another drift on the road. He hoped he was making good time because the last thing he wanted was to be stuck out in the elements when night came. It was not that cold right now, but the snow was coming down at an alarming rate, making it hard to see all that far in front of him. He did not want to admit that Sarah might have had a point about sheltering in place until her knee was better. Already he missed her company. Chatting with her would have made the journey feel shorter and the time fly by faster. By himself, he was a little bored. Sarah Hawkins, from a tiny town called Pendle, Jake mused. She was the first woman in a long time to catch his attention. He liked her forthright way of talking, her spunky attitude and the fact that she did not pander to him. It was probably due to the nature of their close proximity since the plane crash and being stranded, but Jake liked Sarah. She was a bit of a mess. Even when they had argued yesterday, he had enjoyed it. She gave as good as she got. It had been fun to be challenged and to have to argue the point. As CEO of Ramsley Insurance, Jake often just told his co-workers what was going to happen, and it simply did. Rarely did he have to assert his authority or his intelligence in an argument. It had been refreshing to battle wills with Sarah. Now he needed to make sure that he rescued her. Not only as a point of pride, since Jake had gone off this morning determined to make a rescue happen, but also for their survival. He refused to call it sneaking away while Sarah was sleeping. He did not sneak, and if Sarah had not slept so deeply, she would have woken up on time to catch Jake. Truth was, Jake liked her. He had not truly liked a woman in a long time. People always tended to want something from him. 
part of the Ramsley dynasty, or his money, or his business connections, or whatever. They did not seem to like hanging around Jake for just himself. So Jake had a few friends, and rarely ever dated. It was much simpler that way. Yet Jake liked Sarah. He liked her open, fresh way of talking, the way she invited him to share the joke with her when she was happy, the way she managed to get into trouble, the way she smiled and how she talked herself through instructions. He was smitten, as his mother would say. Jake had the feeling Beverly would like her. He gave his head a shake. It was far too soon to think thoughts like introducing her to his mother. He had only known her for three days. Even so, Jake wanted to get to know her better. Maybe, after they were on their way and back on their travels, he could get her phone number and a promise to see him again. Satisfied with that idea, Jake continued to make his way through the snow until he came across a split in the road. There were no street signs, nor was either way plowed. Pulling out the map, Jake studied it. This was not on the map. Jake frowned and looked at both the fork in the road and at the map. They just did not correlate. Sarah had said that things might have changed, and she was right. What did they know about how long logging roads were upkept? Jerry's logging road on the map listed toward the right, so Jake decided to go right and hope that he was going in the direction of the town. Sterling was bored. Incessantly bored. There was no one to talk to. She could see how Waldo had named a chipmunk Larry and chatted to it. Her phone was dead. Sterling was afraid to make notes on real paper and carry them around to possibly get discovered by Jake. For some reason, Waldo was not a reader, so there were no books in the small cabin. After playing solitaire for the hundredth time with an old deck that was missing the aid of clubs, Sterling was going stir-crazy. It did not help that she was constantly getting up, opening the door, and listening for any sound that might be a snowmobile passing by. Sterling was starting to annoy herself with how many times her mind had made up the sound. The snow was piling up. If Jake got lost, he would not be able to retrace his tracks. Worrying over him was becoming second nature, and Sterling did not like it. She told herself that she was just concerned about getting rescued, not about Jake freezing to death in the snowy wilderness. Not that she would want that to happen to anyone. Sterling huffed out a sigh as she slid a ten of spades into place. A faint noise of a motor came to her ears, but she ignored it. Sterling had been out in the snow too many times today, chasing phantom machines ready to shoot off the flare gun at a moment's notice. Then again, if she missed the opportunity to escape this little shack all because she refused to track down whether or not there was a snowmobile outside... Tossing the card in her hand to the side, Sterling pushed herself to her feet, grabbed the flare gun, and headed to the door. Pulling it open, she listened as the snow fell rapidly. There was a motor. She was certain of it. Stepping out into the snow, she forged a path to the logging road. It was snowing so thickly that she could barely see the shack in the waning light, even though she had left the door open and the stove had a glass window in its little door which would let some light bathe the interior when the fire was lit. Sterling raised the flare gun above her head and hoped that the snowmobiler would see it in the snow. She pulled the trigger and watched as an orange glow appeared above her head. In the gloom, it was not as bright as Sterling would like it. She could only hope that the snowmobiler would see it and come this way. There were still two more flares. She probably had just wasted the one that she had fired since it was snowing quite heavily. Sterling sighed and decided she was not going to use another flare tonight. It had been a long shot for anyone to even see the flare in this storm. She hobbled back to the shack, disappointed and discouraged. Hey! Hey! Jake yelled, waving his hands in the air as the lights from the snowmobiles cut across the road at dusk. He had gotten as far as called Side Road, and had been steadily marching towards Ert's siding. There had even been a sign pointing toward the destination, which had made Jake feel a lot better about his odds of getting to the town versus getting lost. 
Jake stepped into the way of the headlights, praying that they were not going so fast as to run him over. Over here! The two machines slowed to a crawl, pulling up beside him. A man popped open the visor on his helmet. Hi! A little far from home? asked the snowmobiler. Jake Ramsley. Jake held out his hand in greeting. My plane crashed up further on the mountain. I was walking to Earth's siding to try to get help. Earth's siding? The snowmobiler laughed as he shook Jake's hand. That's a ghost town. Hasn't been anyone there for years. Better to go on to Carver's Bend. Nice little town. I'm Lenny Walsh. No one lives in Earth's siding? Jake questioned with a little disappointment. He would have walked there and not found the help that they needed. Not a living soul, confirmed Lenny. He pointed to the other snowmobiler. That's Frank. Hop on and we'll take you to our truck up the highway. Then I can drive you to Carver's Bend. Wait. Jake shook his head at Lenny's offer. There's another person stuck at Waldo's cabin back up on Jerry's logging road. She has an injured knee and is going to need medical care. We need to go back for her. Waldo's cabin? Frank looked at Lenny. Do you know where that is? Lenny whistled. That's a way back. You walked from there? Yes, Jake replied. He was tired. He was also glad that he had run into these two men. Unless Jake was dreaming in the snow right now. Then he was in danger of freezing to death. Jake had heard about how people hallucinated when hypothermia set in. Although, from what he understood, people generally thought they were someplace warm and ended up taking off their coats before curling up on the snow like they were at the beach. Jake was not at the beach, nor did he think he was dreaming. Still, he pinched his hand just to be sure. It was so numb it did not hurt, and that worried Jake a little. It has been a long day. No kidding! Lenny looked at him a little closer. You said there was a plane crash? I think I saw him on the television. Hey, Frank, didn't the news say there was a reward for him? I think you were right, Frank commented excitedly. That's nice. Jake would give them a reward himself if he could just get these two boneheads to rescue him and Sterling. I need to go back to Waldo's cabin to get Sarah. No can do, Lenny said firmly. What? Jake was incredulous. They could not possibly be serious about leaving a woman in the forest to fend for herself. We're running low on gas. Lenny tapped the fuel gauge. Got enough to reach the truck, but we'll need to fill up the gas station. If we go back, we'll just end up stranded. How close is the nearest gas station? asked Jake, relieved that they were not going to abandon Sarah. Then we can come back for Sarah afterward. Nearest gas station is Carver's Bend supplied Frank. About a two-hour drive. Two hours? echoed Jake in disbelief. At this rate, it would be halfway the night before they got back to Sarah. Hop on, invited Frank. Sooner we get to town, the sooner you can come back for your friend. You're gonna be cold in that suit, Lenny eyed Jake's attire critically. I am already cold. Jake took the extra helmet that Frank offered and put it on before straddling the large machine. He had never been on a snowmobile before, and quickly grabbed Frank as they accelerated far too fast for Jake's liking. Soon, Jake realized there was a difference between cold and windchill cold. When he was hiking through the snow, Jake had managed to generate some heat for his body. He also had the luxury of walking with his hands in his pockets to keep them warmer. On the snowmobile, he was forced to hold on for dear life since Frank and Lenny drove at excessive speed on the roadway. Within minutes, his fingers felt frozen stiff and his body felt a chill embed itself within his bones. He wondered if he was going to die of exposure before they made it to the truck. Jake hoped desperately that the truck was equipped with a working heater. Maybe it was a good thing that they were not going back for Sarah right away. He would hate to have her be this cold during the ride to the plowed roadway. Neither of them had been dressed for the elements, yet fortunately it had been rather mild. When he got to Carver's Bend, Jake was going to make sure they had appropriate gear for himself and Sarah when they went back to Waldo's cabin. 
That was if Jake still had any fingers left to use to do up a zipper. Frank slowed as they neared a bend, and a few minutes later the lights of the snowmobile shone on a pickup truck that was parked alongside a plowed road. Lenny pulled up first, cutting the motor to his machine before getting off. A trailer was attached to the pickup. Lenny let down the gate, using it as a ramp for the two snowmobiles. Frank let Jake off the machine, taking his helmet and giving Lenny a set of keys. Better get him inside and warmed up. It had taken Jake two tries to get his shaking frame off the snowmobile. He was so cold. All he could think about was getting inside the pickup with the heat turned on full blast. Lenny let him in, and Jake gratefully held his hands to the dash as Lenny turned on the truck. Is there a hospital at Carver's Bend? There's a clinic. Don't think it's open this time of night, shrugged Lenny. Got some first aid people at the fire and police station. You heard anywhere? Just frozen through. Jake's teeth were chattering. As the dash began kicking out heat, his hands were starting to hurt. I'm more worried about Sarah's knee. I'm more worried about your toes, responded Lenny. Loafers are not exactly fit for hiking through the snow. There was nothing else available, Jake acknowledged with a lift of a shoulder. His feet were pretty numb. He was not looking forward to finding out just how bad of frostbite he probably had gotten. Maybe Jake could bribe them to open the clinic to deal with their injuries. Frank slid into the passenger seat. All secure and ready to go. How much did you say the reward was for this guy, anyways? Don't remember. Lenny helped Jake with his seatbelt since Jake's hands were far too shaky to be able to insert the tongue into the buckle. It was pretty substantial, though. Enough for a beer? laughed Frank. Maybe enough to open a beer store, commented Lenny as he pulled onto the icy road. It is not a bad idea in these parts. Wow. Frank stopped laughing and looked at Jake with a newfound respect. A much. Since I have not watched the news, I cannot really comment, said Jake dryly. Likely, Dylan had overreacted and offered far too much money for any information leading to Jake's whereabouts. However, I assure you that the reward will be paid. Maybe we should ransom him for more money, Frank mused as he eyed Jake. Do not even think about it. Jake's voice cut out icily in the truck. It was a tone of voice that he rarely had to use in the boardroom, but when he did, it was effective. There is no need to be greedy. For a moment, he wondered at the two men he now found himself sharing company with. Would his rescuers put him in an even worse situation? Then, who would rescue Sarah? Leaving the truck did not seem like a good option. First, because he was still half-frozen and unlikely to survive a night outside. Secondly, because he did not know exactly where he was. I was just kidding. Frank offered from the back seat. Frank, leave the guy alone. Lenny grimaced as he maneuvered a particularly slushy patch of roadway. He's not in a joking mood. Frank grumbled as he leaned back, looking out the window. Jake was just thankful they were no longer talking about essentially kidnapping and holding him for ransom. He was also thankful his hands had stopped the searing pain and were now just pins and needles as they thawed out. Head nodding, Jake did not notice when he drifted off to sleep. When the motor quit on the truck, Jake jerked his chin off his chest, looking bleary-eyed out the window. Street lights were on as snow fell gently down on a picturesque street. "'Welcome to Carver's Bend,' commented Lenny as he got out of the truck. Stiffly, Jake undid his seatbelt. As he emerged from the pickup, he noticed that they were at the police station. Come on, Jack, grinned Frank. We're going to collect that reward on you. It's Jake. Jake corrected the man, then wondered why he cared. Help, it was literally a few dozen feet away. Finally, someone would go and rescue Sarah. A profound feeling of relief swamped Jake as he made his way up the icy sidewalk to the building, escorted by Frank and Lenny. Hey, Justin! Frank yelled in the empty front lobby. We'd like to collect a reward for capturing this guy. Lenny rolled his eyes. 
not for capturing him. He's not wanted or anything. It's a reward for finding him because he was lost. What is going on? A tired-looking man in a brown uniform came forward with a yawn. There is no need to yell. Jake decided to take charge of the situation before it got out of hand. Stepping forward, he offered a hand in greeting to the officer. Jake Ramsley, I have been missing since Tuesday after our plane crashed on the mountain. I believe the gentlemen with me are expecting a reward which I am sure my family will be happy to provide once I can contact them. Justin shook Jake's hand, sizing him up. You're that billionaire from the news that has gone missing? I'll need to see some identification. Absolutely. Jake pulled out his wallet, handing over his license. There's still another person from the plane and a cabin not far from here. She has an injury and needs to be rescued. Justin frowned as he typed in some information from the driver's license into the computer. You've got an unpaid parking ticket. Excuse me? Jake did not see how that was remotely relevant. There's a person still missing on the mountain, and you're worried about a parking ticket. It's in violation of the law. Justin typed a few more words with his index finger only, taking his time. I will be happy to pay the ticket, growled Jake. He could not think of why he would have a ticket, unless it was an extremely old one, since he now used a driver in a company car nearly all the time. How much is it? With the latest fees and interest, Justin trailed off as a woman in the uniform entered the station. She raised an eyebrow at the gathering. Can I help you? Lenny pulled off his woolen hat, causing his hair to stand on end. Hello, Sheriff Terry Whittle. Frank mumbled a greeting as well, shuffling a little behind Lenny as if to shield himself from the law woman. Look interrupted Jake. I am happy to pay the ticket. However, I think it's a little more important to get a plan together to rescue Miss Hawkins. Justin, are you trying to scam this man out of money? frowned Terry Whittle. I told you that if I caught you doing that trick again, you would be cleaning the cars for the next month. Justin sighed. He's loaded. He could have spared a little change for our petty cash. Knock it off. She pinned Jake with a hard look. Who is Miss Hawkins? The other passenger on the plane. Jake explained, tamping down his frustration. What kind of town was this? His plane crashed, Lenny helpfully supplied. He's the guy from the news with a reward out on him. I am not wanted, Jake said dryly as Terry Whittle eyed him with suspicion. My family appears to have put up a reward for my safe return. Identification? she asked firmly, holding out her hand. Your deputy has it, responded Jake. It checks out, Justin sourly replied, holding out Jake's driver's license for the sheriff's perusal. It is a nice reward, also. Too bad it goes to these two bumpkins. Hey, we found him. Frank said hotly. Frank, I thought I told you not to come into my station again unless it was an actual emergency, Terry Whittle said mildly as she inspected the identification. Mr. Ramsley, welcome to Carver's Bend. Jake gratefully took his driver's license back as she offered it to him and shook her hand. Thank you. If you will have a seat, I'll grab a local map and we can pinpoint where your traveling companion is. Terry Whittle moved to a filing cabinet. No need for that, Lenny spoke up. He blushed a little as the sheriff's eyes turned on him. She's at Waldo's cabin, according to Mr. Ramsley. I know where that is. We can have the snowmobiles gassed up and ready in no time. Gas them up, Lenny. I want you and those snowmobiles back at the station as soon as possible. She pulled out the map and set it on the desk in front of Jake with a pen. You and I will head out to the cabin. Justin, you will stay here with Mr. Ramsley, and we will keep you advised on any updates as they happen. Contact Doc Luce and have him come over here to look at our guest and be available for when our second rescue comes in. What am I supposed to do? Frank asked with a frown. 
Disappear? Terry Whittle suggested unkindly. Lenny jammed his hat back on. Come on, Frank, let's go gas up the truck and machines. I have a map. Jake lowered himself into a chair near the desk and pulled out the map that had come from the cabin. The Waldo sticker is where the cabin is. Where did you get this? Justin scowled at the old map. From Waldo's cabin, sighed Jake. These people were beginning to get tiresome. Since he needed their help, Jake tried to tamp down his impatience. Could we just get on to rescuing Sarah? I don't care about the cost. I will foot the bill. I'd just like to have her safe. Justin's eyes lit up at Jake's words, but Terry Whittle frowned at her deputy. Do not go off half-cocked, Justin. Search and rescue is in the yearly budget. I appreciate the thought, Mr. Ramsley. I'll ensure that we do everything possible to find your traveling companion and bring her back to Carver's Bend as soon as possible. Thank you. Jake felt a little relief at her speech. She marked off where Waldo's cabin was on her map, folded it up, and put it in her parka. If you don't mind, I'd like you to take your map with us as well. Terry Whittle accepted the map from Jake. You can also use our phone. I'm sure your family will be happy to hear from you. Again, thank you. Jake resolved to contribute to the police budget. Even if Justin was annoying, and if the sheriff brought back Sarah, then she deserved something. Maybe a new vehicle, or money for new uniforms. Under Terry Whittle's questions, Jake explained about the plane crash, where some of the wreckage might be, his and Sarah's hike down the mountain, then finding Waldo's cabin, which was really more of a shack. Now that he was in the safety of the police station, the story seemed a little surreal. Lenny came back in, stomping off snow and yanking off his hat again, before running a hand through his hair in a useless attempt to smooth it out. All ready to go. Where is Frank? Terry Whittle asked dryly. I dropped him off at home. Lenny squeezed his hat in his hands, shifting from foot to foot. You do know that his snowmobile license is revoked, Justin mentioned casually. Lenny's eyes widened. No, he didn't tell me that. Terry Whittle sighed. Mind the shop, Justin. Let's go, Lenny. Yes, ma'am. Lenny pulled his hat on almost over his eyebrows as he followed the sheriff out the door. He has a thing for your boss, Jake commented absently. He probably should not have said anything. It was not his place, but Jake was so tired he supposed it had just slipped out. No kidding. Justin put the phone in front of Jake. It was an old, rotary-style antique. If you want to make some calls, here is the phone. Jake debated asking if Justin was serious, but the young deputy went back to typing on his computer. It looked like an old 90s throwback with the large monitor. Maybe a technology upgrade was in order for this place. Jake shrugged internally and picked up the receiver to find a dial tone. Thank goodness his grandmother had owned one of these and he had used it as a kid. Otherwise, he would not have known how to operate the phone. Dialing Dylan's number, Jake waited for the call to go through. Hello? Dylan said hurriedly into the phone. Dylan, it's Jake. He identified himself. Jake! There was palpable relief in Dylan's voice. Where are you? What happened? You would not believe what has been going on. I was in a plane crash. Jake kept his voice calm. I'm okay. I'm in a small town called Carver's Bend. Carver's Bend? Never heard of it. Where even is that? asked Dylan. Not too sure. Jake glanced at Justin, but decided not to ask him. The important thing is I'll probably be on my way to New York later tomorrow, or the next day. Did Everett fly in? Yes, he's here, replied Dylan. We were worried about you when we did not hear from you. I'm fine, Jake repeated for Dylan's benefit. The pilot unfortunately did not make it. However, I and the flight attendant, Sarah Hawkins, are fine. Jake, did you just say the flight attendant was fine? Dylan's tone of voice sounded a little weird. Yes, why? What's wrong? frowned Jake. Her name is not Sarah Hawkins, and she is not a flight attendant. 
he informed his brother. What? Jake's stomach dropped. Dylan had to be wrong. Her name was Sarah, and she was a flight attendant. Otherwise, she would not have been permitted to be on the flight. There was security to make sure of that. Who else could she be? Dylan gave a reluctant sigh. She is Sterling Denver. No. Jake bit out the word. He closed his eyes and took in a deep, calming breath, wishing he could shut out Dylan's words. It's all over the tabloid dubious. They're milking your disappearance with their star writer for all they are worth. Dylan explained patiently. Yesterday, there were pictures taken from the inside of the plane, with you working on your laptop, splashed all over the front page. Today, it was pictures of a cozy little cabin. The headline said something like, Love Nest for Two? It's her, Jake. It's Sterling Denver. She's been lying to you the entire time. Consider subscribing to the channel if you enjoyed this chapter of Book 5 of the Ramsey Brothers series, Stranded with the Billionaire. Look for the next chapter coming soon. Happy listening!